suggestions for future talks that you want us to present, you can write to us on a Google Sheet that you will find in this website. It's our uh, Coffee Shop Astrophysics webpage. If you are interested in similar talks by other group of people, we have one at um, in Madison by the Astronomy on Tap group, which is done by students from UW Madison. So Coffee Shop Astrophysics is a group of graduate students from UWM's Center for Gravitation, Cosmology, and Astrophysics. And today's speakers are myself and Simon. And with all of that out of the way, let's get started with today's talk. So we've chosen a very fancy title for this talk, and that's Expedition Lunaris, Reaching for the Moon. And we'll be talking about the events led, that led up to the first human landing on the moon and what happened after that, as well as missions done by other space agencies and what you should look out for in the future regarding moon missions. So let's start off with some facts about the moon. The word moon originates from an old English word, mona, which means measure or uh, month. So a lot of the ancient civilizations used calendars that were based on lunar cycles, hence the use of this word moon for referring to our uh, neighbor. And this is one such uh, lunar calendar, which is in Warren Field in Scotland. So it's an open field where there are like 12 pits dug out on the field, which indicate 12 different phases of the moon. The moon is our natural satellite. We have a lot of arch artificial satellites like GPS satellites circling the Earth. Moon is one such satellite which orbits our Earth, but it's a natural one. And uh, a day on a moon, just like the Earth orbits, in, like Earth rotates in about an axis, the moon also rotates about an axis, and a day on moon is 29.5 uh, days on Earth. And in that same amount of time, the moon does a complete loop around the Earth. And because these two times are same, this phenomena is called tidal locking. And what do I mean by tidal locking? If you see the, this animation here, this on the left, we have the moon tidal locked, where you see that the face that is drawn on the moon is always facing towards Earth. And because of this tidal locking phenomena, we only see one side of the moon from Earth, while the other side, which is the back of the face, is never seen from the Earth. It's always facing away from us. Now, like, but for when, if it's not tidally locked, then we can see all of the faces at different points of the moon, like in different positions of the orbit. Now, in popular culture, there is often this word that you will hear called dark side of the moon. Well, it's kind of a misnomer because the dark, the far side, which is the side that is facing away from us, is not really dark. Uh, it receives sunlight, but it just happens to not be seen from Earth. Hence, we, it's like an unseen side, so we kind of named it the dark side. But it's not actually dark. The more scientifically accurate uh, term is far side of the moon. So the moon has been up in the sky since the time of the first humans. But before telescope was invented, we never got a close look of how the moon, like the lunar surface. And Thomas Harriot is credited to be the first person who pointed a telescope on July 26, 1609. And based on his observations, whatever he saw with his telescope, he drew some illustrations of the lunar surface. He observed a half moon, hence on this left picture, you see there is this line, which indicates that one side is the dark, like it's not lit up, so he didn't see it. But the other side, he drew some illustrations of what he saw. And as you can see, they are not very detailed. Then within four months, Galileo also did the same. He observed the moon with his telescope. And he also made illustrations which are much more detailed. And he published these results before Harriet published his uh, findings. Then we have Giovanni Battista Riccioli, who was an Italian astronomer and a priest. On 1651, he released a book where he had lots of illustrations of the lunar surface that he drew by himself. And you can see they have very high detail and along with like the drawings he also named different features that he saw on the surface of the moon and the naming naming conventions that he used are still used to this day and what are some of those naming conventions he used maria or mare which means oceans for the dark patches that he saw on the lunar surface which to him looked like as if they were oceans he used lacus which means lakes for smaller such planes 
similar to Maria's but smaller in size, Mons for the mountains, and Catena for the craters that he saw on the lunar surface. Then in 1753, Roger Joseph Boscovich argued that the moon has no atmosphere. And in 18, 1824, we have Franz von Grithausen, who, is, who was a Bavarian astronomer, who suggested that the craters that were seen on the moon, that we still see on the moon, are a result of meteorite impacts on the lunar surface. So a lot of these early observations were done using optical telescopes, and they were not very powerful. And with just this telescope, there is not enough that we can like, figure out about, how the, uh, about different things about the moon. And also, we don't see like, the other side of the moon as well. So these uh, telescopes were not enough to answer questions like, how is the moon formed? What's on the other side of the moon, the far side that we don't see from the Earth? Whether there was any life on the moon? Or did the moon have any oceans at some point of time? And most importantly, the biggest question, is the moon made of cheese? Like you can see here, this in, in this famous cartoon, Wallace and Gromit decide to uh, build their own rocket and fly to space, uh, to the moon, to get some cheese because they ran out of cheese on a bank holiday. So this brings us to the 19th century, the beginning of the spacefaring era. We have here Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, uh, who was a Russian scientist, a rocket scientist, who in 1898 uh, proposed the idea of exploring space using rockets and using liquid fuel for that purpose. And because of his ideas, which a lot of which became a reality, he is called the father of modern aeronautics. And this is one of his like very early diagrams of what a rocket could be like. He even calculated the equation of motion that a rocket follows while when it launches, the rocket equation. Then on March 16, 1926, we have Robert Goddard, who successfully launched the first liquid fuel rocket. And for his achievements, he's called the father of rocket, modern rocketry. And this is the rocket that he built. He's standing beside it. And if the name Godard sounds familiar to, to you, then the Godard Space Station, which is right near DC, is named after this guy. And he has like, uh, he's credited for a lot of things that he did for space travel in the US. Then we have, in 1937, Hermann Oberth, who, along with a lot of other German scientists, built what is called the V2 rocket, which was the most advanced rocket of its generation, as well as the most deadliest weapon of its time. Uh, this rocket was used in some, like, the, it, it was used while bombing London for, like, there were, like, over 1,000 uh, such rockets that were pointed towards London, and uh, this was used during World War II. And the rocket technology that the Germans had at the time during World War II was far superior to what the Allies had. So the Soviets and uh, the Americans, after the end of World War, realized that rockets have a huge potential for military purpose. So they set up a lot of experimental programs to build their own missiles, as well as recruit the scientists from Germany. So one such operation is called Operation Paperclip, which was done by the US where they hired more than 1,600 German scientists, engineers, and technicians who they found while advancing through the Axis uh, areas. And one of the from this group was Werner von Braun, who was responsible for, like, he was the main guy who, behind the development of the V2 rocket, USA hired him for their own missile program, and in, uh, finally, eventually, he will be responsible for, uh, for building the rocket that would take humans, like the first Americans, to the moon. And like, because like, he had a very dark past, but it's also that during Cold War, he's often called uh, like a war hero kind of uh, figure. Now, it's, like, it's still a matter of debate among historians whether Werner von Braun was a war criminal or a war, Cold War hero. So, how do we launch a rocket into space? Well, there are a few challenges. So unlike uh, uh, aeroplanes, which have wings, there is no atmosphere in space. So wings won't work, because there won't be any wind. And on top of that, combustion engines, which uh, aeroplanes use, burn 
fuel with the help of oxygen from the atmosphere. Again, because there is no atmosphere in space, this kind of a system, a combustion engine, wouldn't necessarily work. Tsiolkovsky, who I mentioned before, the Russian scientist, was the first to identify that the biggest challenge a rocket can face is at the point of liftoff. Well, it will, it will have the maximum weight because it will have to carry its own fuel as well as an oxidant which will help to burn the fuel even in space where there is no atmosphere. And he also suggested that the most efficient method of sending a rocket to space would be to have it built in stages. Each stage will be a self-contained rocket which will boost stages above it up to a certain height until it runs out of fuel and then separates out and the remaining stage fly on. And the basic principle with in, uh, based on which rockets work is the Newton's third law, which you know as every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So you have the thrust uh, from the combustion of the gases which the boosters ex uh, eject that pushes the rocket upward as a reaction force. Now, in order to escape the gravity of the Earth, the rockets need to attain some velocity. And escape velocity is the velocity that rockets need in order to es uh, escape from the gravitational uh, pull of the Earth. And for Earth, the speed is 11.2 kilometers per second. And to give you an idea of how fast this is, if you travel at this speed, you can move from the North Pole to the South Pole in 21 minutes which is pretty fast. For the moon, just for a comparison, it's 2.38 kilometers per second, much less than that of Earth, because the moon has much lower gravity. But rockets don't necessarily need to attain this speed. What's more important is to counteract the force of gravity. So rockets use what, is, what are called as propulsion engines. These engines provide a constant acceleration upwards that is sufficient to counteract the force of gravity that's acting downwards. That way, in, in, uh, without uh, reaching a speed of escape velocity, they can still fly into space, as long as they have enough force upwards that can counteract gravity. Well, with all of this out of the way, now that we know a bit of rocket science, we come to the Cold War era, and this is where the space race picked up pace. So the space race began with the Soviets sending Sputnik 1 into orbit on October 4th, 1957, which was the first man-made object to reach space. And within a month, they launched Sputnik 2 with the, fir like the first living being on board, which was the dog Laika. And on January 31st, 1958, the US Army launched Explorer 1, which was the first US object, US man-made object to reach space. And in October of the same year, 1958, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, was formally uh, created with the goal of peaceful exploration of space for the benefit of humankind. So this brings us to the, one of the earliest known, uh, earliest uh, moon missions, the Soviet Luna program. It was a set of missions between 1959 and 1976 to send unmanned missions to the moon. And on January 2nd, 1959, Luna 1 was launched, which was the first uh, spacecraft to reach the vicinity of the moon. And then on September of the same year, Luna 2 was launched, which was the first spacecraft to reach the moon as well as impact the surface. And then finally we have on October of 1959, Luna 3, this was the first spacecraft that reached the moon and gave us a picture of the far side of the moon. So this is the first time that we are seeing the other side of the moon that we never saw, never got to see from Earth. And this is the picture that it transmitted back. Now, this was the Cold War was picking up pace as well as the space race. And on April 12, 1961, Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first person to reach space. And this was a big deal back then. Uh, and it's like both the US and the Soviets were trying to get someone. And so the Soviets took the lead in the space race with this launch. But the Americans weren't behind. On May 1961, Alan Shepard became the first American to go to space. However, unlike for uh, Gagarin, uh, Yuri Gagarin did a complete orbit around the Earth. 
but Alan Shepard just went in a suborbital flight and did not complete one orbit. Now, what do I mean by an orbital and a suborbital flight? Well, an orbit is at a fixed distance from the Earth. So what Yuri Gagarin did was fly a spacecraft at a fixed distance and did a complete loop around the Earth before la uh, landing on the surface. While what Alan Shepard did was he went up to space and then in an arc, followed an arc trajectory and then came back to the surface. So still, even though um, an American reached space, they were kind of lagging behind what the Soviets achieved back then. Now, uh, around this time, 1961 was where the height of Cold War was. Uh, there was a, uh, like a perception among Americans that the Soviets were leading the space race, which was kind of true because they managed to send the uh, first uh, man-made object into space as well as the first human into space. So the president at the time, JFK, who was just elected on January of 1961, had a huge pressure on him. And along with that, there was also the Bay of Pigs invasion, which was a big failure for the US. So like it damaged the prestige of Americans significantly. So JFK realized that there was a political need to establish that the US can also lead the space race and has the potential to dominate it. So he asked the vice president at the time, Lyndon Johnson, to investigate whether there was any such achievement that the US could achieve before the Soviets, whether it be launching a space station or sending someone in an orbit around the moon or even landing someone in space. So LBJ uh, consulted with the officials at NASA. He was the chairman of NASA at the time. And he reported back to JFK that uh, launching a space station before the Soviets was impossible, sending someone on an, in an orbit around the moon before Soviets was uncertain, but landing someone before the Soviets was a big possibility, but it was also the most costliest option at the time. But that was enough for JFK because he needed something to get the American crowd in his favor. And on May 25th, 1961, John Kennedy stood before a special joint session of the Congress where he uh, addressed his ambitious goal of landing uh, an American on the moon by the end of the decade. And then on September 12, 1962, Kennedy delivered his famous speech, which is nowadays known as the moon speech, where he addressed a crowd gathered at Rice, Rice University. And this is one of his lines that he says. So instead of me repeating the line, I'll just let him repeat the words. But let's see, we'll try if it works or not. I guess I'll have to say it instead of him repeating it, but you can kind of imagine what he's saying. So this is a line where he says, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And it said that after he made this speech, the budget of NASA was increased by 89% with one primary goal in mind, to send, to land a person on the moon. So this brings us to the Ranger program. Uh, this was a set of uh, uncrewed missions to the moon by the US with the objective of getting close-up pictures of the moon, because these pictures would eventually help NASA decide where to land their astronauts. Now, the first few Ranger programs, Rangers 1 to 6, were all failures, whether it be technical fault, camera failure, or launch failure. But then. On July 29th, 1960, uh, July 28th, 1964, uh, Ranger 7 was launched, which became the first spacecraft, uh, US spacecraft, to reach moon and transmit close-up pictures of the moon, of the lunar surface. And it transmitted a total of 4,308 uh, images in 15 minutes. And these two images are said to be the first and last images that uh, Ranger 7 took. So the last image was around three seconds before it impacted the lunar surface. And finally, we come to the Apollo program. All of this was building up to this program. This is the third crewed mission to space by the US. 
uh, preceded by the Mercury program, which launched Alan Shepard into space, uh, as well as the Gemini program, which uh, was a mission to figure out like how to uh, build advanced spacecrafts. Now, the Apollo program was originally conceived at the time of like during the term of Dwight Eisenhower, and originally its objective was not to send humans to moon. Uh, its original uh, uh, objective was to develop advanced spacecrafts. But after 1961, its uh, goal changed to sending uh, people on the moon, and the Gemini program took on what Apollo originally intended to do. And this brings us to the first Apollo 1 program. Well, originally it was not named Apollo 1, it was named uh, Apollo Saturn 204, the fourth uh, launch, uh, not, not necessarily launch, but fourth uh, mission in the Apollo program. Uh, it was set to fly on February 21st, 1967, but unfortunately it did not. And on January 27th, just a month before the launch, the astronauts were testing the space capsule on Earth and a flash fire broke out inside, which took the lives of all the three astronauts. Uh, but at the time, it was not Apollo, not named Apollo 1. Then we come to Apollo 4, which was launched on November 9, 1967. This was a test of the Saturn V launch, launch vehicle, which is this rocket that you see here. Uh, this, was, this is what will eventually carry Neil Armstrong and the others to uh, the moon. Uh, this mission was originally given the name, it was designated Saturn Apollo 501. 5 because it was testing Saturn V rocket and 01 because this was the first test of this Saturn V launch vehicle. Now you might be wondering where's Apollo 2 and 3? Well, before the Apollo Saturn 204, which was the first mission that I showed you, the first crewed mission uh, was uh, about to take place, there were three more uncrewed tests of the Saturn I launch system, a smaller rocket in 1966. They were designated AS-201, AS-202, and AS-203. And then, on April 24th, before the launch of what would be Apollo 4, which was the Saturn V launch that I showed in the previous slide, uh, NASA decided to posthumously name the first crewed mission which would have happened as Apollo 1, which was initially named Apollo 2 AS-204. And Instead of retroactively naming these missions with some number, they chose to not name any program as Apollo 2 or 3. Instead, since the Apollo 4 mission was the fourth uncrewed test, they named it Apollo 4, which is the previous mission that I showed you, this one. So this was then changed its name to Apollo 4, the Saturn Apollo 501 mission. Then we have Apollo 5 and 6. Again, these two were both uncrewed missions. Apollo 5 tested the lunar lander module, which would take the astronauts from the orbit of moon to the surface. And uh, uh, Apollo 6 was again a test of the Saturn V launch vehicle, making it suitable for taking the astronauts all the way to the moon. And then uh, before going into the next Apollo missions, which were all crewed missions, I want to talk a little about the rocket, Saturn V. This is still date one of the largest rockets that was built, although recent NASA and SpaceX rockets have kind of, uh, they are larger, but before that, this was the largest rocket that was ever built. And it was a three-stage rocket act active from 1967 to 1973. Uh, it was built under the direction of Warner Von Braun, who I mentioned before, the Nazi uh, rocket scientist who later came to the US. He, was, he had a big contribution in, de in the development of the Saturn V launch vehicle. And till date, it has a record of carrying the high, uh, heaviest payload as well as the largest payload capacity. And then we come to the first crewed Apollo mission that launched in space, the Apollo 7. It was launched on October 11th, 1968. And it was a test of this uh, command and service module, which would be the spacecraft that would orbit the moon while the lander would take the people, the astronauts down on the surface. And along with the test of this command and service module, they also test, tested the live TV, TV broadcast from space. And if you look at the uh, mission patch, you will see that it shows the last names of the crew members as well as uh, 
uh, a depiction of what the mission is about. So it, sh it shows you that there is this command and service model which was tested in an orbit around the Earth. And this is uh, an image from the broadcast that was done from the command and service module in orbit. Pretty cool for the amount of technology that they had at that time. The next mission, Apollo 8, it was launched on December 21st, 1968, and its objective was to fly all the way to the moon, do an orbit, and return back to Earth. And you can again see on the mission patch here, it shows you the trajectory that the mission took. And this is a very famous picture. It's one of the most influential and greatest pictures that's ever been taken of the Earth rise. So just like we have moonrise and sunrise that you, we see from Earth, this is a picture of the rising Earth that was seen from the, uh, by the crew members of Apollo 8 when they were in an orbit around the moon. And this was taken by one of the astronauts, William Anders, on December 24th, 1968, while on their mission to the moon. And this picture is like pretty great. You can see this is the blue planet that we live in in the middle of this vast space. Our entire lives are all in this small planet in the middle of this huge universe. Next, we have Apollo 9. This was launched on March 3rd, 1969, and its objective was to again test the lunar lander module, which you can see here. This was again tested in an orbit around the Earth. And then Apollo 10, launched on May 8th, 1969, was a full crewed mission to the moon, which would test everything, starting with the lander module as well as the command and service module in an orbit around the uh, uh, moon, except it did not land. And finally, we come to Apollo 11. The mission was launched on July 16, 1969, and it was responsible for taking the astronauts Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Edwin Aldrin to the moon. And Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin were the first humans to set ste uh, set a step on the moon. Neil Armstrong was the first one, followed by Edwin Aldrin. Now, uh, this lander module for the Apollo 11 was named Eagle. And the time when it touched down on the lunar surface, Neil Armstrong told the command center back in Houston that the Eagle has landed, which is the title of this slide. And if you've heard this phrase, this is where it came from. Now, these are some diagrams to, from the original Apollo documents to show how the mission would proceed. So here we have the astronauts being inserted into the, uh, into the rocket. They do some system check before launch. And this is the Saturn staging, where it uh, flies to certain distance, uh, then removes some uh, the lower stages, and then all the way flies in an orbit around the Earth, and then is launched uh, towards Moon. And then here, right before landing on the Moon, the command and service module separates out. It connects with the lander module by turning around. And then it starts in an orbit around the moon before it makes landing, which we can see here. This is the command and service module. This is the lander module. The two astronauts, one of the astronauts stayed back in the command and service module because he was flying it around an orbit on, uh, of the moon. The lander module carried the other two uh, astronauts and it separated out of the command and service module and it, it, it landed on the moon. And then the first human sets step on the moon. So this brings us to the first step that Neil Armstrong took. Uh, this is a picture that Neil Armstrong took the moment he landed. So you can see the lander module legs on the surface of the moon. And this is an image from the camera that the lunar module, uh, the lander module had of Neil Armstrong descending from the stairs. And I also had an audio clip of the state, the line, the famous line that Neil Armstrong made, one small step for humanity one giant leap for mankind, but sorry for the bad audio. I couldn't like uh, sh uh, give you the actual audio. And these are some paper clips from that time when the first human set foot on the moon. We have one from Wisconsin State Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, all like front page news, because this was a very big event at that time. So what did the Apollo 11 astronauts do while they were on the moon? 
Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong. Well, they were there on two, for two hours, and the site where they landed, landed uh, was situated in an area called Mayor Tranquilitatis. Mayor, once again, I'll remind you, Mayor was the naming convention that was used to identify these large dark planes on the surface of the moon because they, from the Earth, they appeared as if they were oceans on the surface. And because it's on this particular area, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin decided to name the base Tranquility Base, where they landed, the point where they landed. And while they were there, they performed various tests on the surface of the moon, collecting rock samples, doing solar wind tests that, like you see here, setting a footprint and de determining how much, how deep the footprint is on the surface. Then they also set up what is called the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package, which tested various things like seismic activities, moon quakes on the lunar surface, heat flow on the lunar surface, and various other experiments. So uh, this is the experiment package that you see here. And all these photos, the astronaut that you see are, is Buzz Aldrin. These are some more pictures of uh, the, from the mission. Uh, so this image here and this one, these two images are the only images of Neil Armstrong from that mission because Neil Armstrong was the one who was carrying the camera and taking pictures. So most of the astronaut pictures that you see, in fact, this one, is of Buzz Aldrin saluting the American flag. Few pictures of while they were on the moon. What did the Apollo astronauts leave behind on the moon? Well, they, first of all, they did leave behind all the heavy equipment that they took with them, the experiment packages, the instruments and stuff. But apart from that, uh, they also left behind a goodwill message on a silicon disk about the size of a 50 cent piece. It contained uh, goodwill messages from leaders of 73 countries around the world. They also left behind an Apollo 1 mission patch to commemorate the astronauts who perished during the Apollo 1 testing. They also left behind two medals which were awarded to the late Soviet cosmonauts Yuri Gagarin and Vladimir Komarov. And this was done to like commemorate the people who perished in pursuit of human space flight. And along with that, they also left behind a plaque which reads here, there is a message on it which reads here, men from the planet Earth for set foot upon the moon, July 1969 AD. We came in peace for all mankind. And this last peace message is in accordance with NASA's policy of peaceful exploration of space. And along with this message, there are signatures of the three crew members as well as a signature of the president who was at that time was Richard Nixon. And this is the, again, some more uh, doc document pictures of how the lunar lander would return, like the astronauts would return to Earth. So they return to the lunar lander spacecraft. The top part of that lunar lander ascends while the legs stay behind. Then the lander connects with the command module, which is orbiting moon and the two astronauts inside the lander move into the command module, leave the lunar lander, and then fly back to, like, do an orbit and fly back towards moon, uh, towards Earth. And while re-entering Earth, they re eject this uh, front portion where the three astronauts are sitting, which does a splash down on the ocean and is recovered by the uh, Navy. Now, after Apollo 11, there were six more Apollo missions, all crewed landings on the moon, Apollo 12 to 17, and these are the mission patches. All of them were successful except for Apollo 13, which was a successful failure. Successful because uh, the crew members safely returned to Earth. Failure because they couldn't make a landing on the moon. Why? Because uh, while on their journey to the moon, one of the, uh, their ex oxygen tanks exploded, and hence they had to, instead of landing, they did a loop around the moon and then returned back to Earth. And there is even a 1995 movie called Apollo 13 starring Bill Paxton, Tom Hanks, and Kevin Bacon, which surrounds the events of this particular mission. So you can check that out. It's a very cool movie. Now, along with the, uh, like, while returning to Earth, all the Apollo missions brought back samples of rock from the moon. And this is one such sample that, that is pictured here. It's from the Apollo 15 mission, and it's called the Genesis Rock. And radiometric studies from these uh, moon samples show that 
the the age of these rocks vary from 3.16 billion years to all the way up to 4.44 billion years, which is pretty close to around when it's estimated the, that the Earth was formed. The, and it's also that these uh, rocks are largely made up of silicates and oxides, gives us an idea of the composition. And from the sample of Apollo 11, three new minerals were discovered at the time, armalcolite, tranquilityite, and pyrophoroxide. The first two names are named after the Apollo 11 mission, so armalcolite is named after the last names of the three crew members, Armstrong, Aldrin, Collins, so armalcolite, and tranquilityite is named after the base where they landed, tranquility base. Pyrophoroxide is a, just a chemical name. But these minerals were later found on Earth, so it's not that these are exclusive to the moon. But unfortunately, we haven't found any cheese so far. Uh, but don't lose hope. We still haven't explored every inch of the moon. Maybe if we explore completely the craters on the South Pole, there might be some cheese there. Now, why did the Americans stop sending uh, more moon missions? Well, the Apollo program was, to put it simply, it was a political statement that JFK had to make to show that the Americans are Far, they can lead the space race as well as they can beat the Soviets. So technology and science was not a big priority at that time. And the Apollo mission cost $20 billion, which was pretty big for the time. And like originally, it was estimated to cost $7 billion, but it ended up cost, uh, costing $20 billion. And at that time, in the 1970s, US was going through an inflation, and then there was the ongoing war in Vietnam, so people were not really happy about the idea of spending huge sums of money on space programs because they didn't, they didn't see much benefit on it. So there was very less national support for this. So NASA's budget by 1971 was reduced to a mere $3 billion compared to what Apollo cost, it's very less. And by the end of Cold War, there was this strategic arms limitation talk which was a uh, treaty made between uh, nations to reduce the development of missiles and ICBMs, that also meant that production of these space launch vehicles like rockets was reduced. And as was the popular belief during that time, even is among conspiracy theorists, the moon landing was not a Hollywood production. So this is not true. The moon landing indeed happened, but today I won't go into debunking the various myths and conspiracy theories around it. There are lots of well-documented, like they have been debunked. All I'll say is that it's been over 50 years. If it really were a Hollywood production, we would have found a whistleblower by now, given around that time there were lots of scandals that happened and we found out about it by now. And with this, I'll end my part of the presentation and hand it over to Simon. Thank you. All right, thank you, Tamal. So in the next slide, I'm going to talk about the origin of the moon. So from the samples we brought back from the moon, we found that the composition of the moon rock is actually the same as the Earth's. So there's a hypothesis about the origin of the moon that the moon is actually the debris of the moon, uh, of the Earth being hit by a mass-sized object, um, which is called fear. And here's a simulation showing the formation of the moon.
So other than the for, than the origin of the moon, the scientists has also done um, several mappings on the moon, and one of them is the elevation mapping, which shows the um, simply of the elevation on the surface of the moon. And as you could see, um, the south pole of the moon, which is the purple region, is much lower than the than the others because there are many craters around there, and the mappings of the elevation would be helpful for deciding the landing position for future missions. Because um, if you land in a flat region, there might be a crash to your spacecraft. So it would be helpful for the future missions. And we also got the mineral mapping, which shows the mineral distribution. And it helps us to decide the future locations for establishing um, things like moon base because we would like to establish the moon base in a convenient location for mining these resources. So here we come to the summary of Cold War. Um, for the lunar program of Soviet Union, they have tried like 44 attempts, and only 15 of them are success. So the success rate is 34%. And for the Apollo program of the US, they are like around the same number of attempts, which is 40, and the success rate is, however, 60%. So actually won the Cold War, uh, I mean the space race. Even though the Cold War has ended, um, the exploration to the space So there are other countries, um, they're keeping up the technologies, then they are sending the people to the moon as well. So we have China, India, Japan, and Europe. And in particular, I'm going to talk about some of the notable ones. So for the China one, they have the Chang'e missions, which is um, from around 2010 to beyond 2030. And one of them is Chang'e 4, which is launched on um, December 7th, 2018. And it made China to become the first nation to soft land on the far side of the moon, which is right here. And by soft land, we mean that um, the spacecraft is landing without any damage. And they also brought the cotton seed to the moon, and it made the cotton to be the first plant um, sprouting on the moon and even outside of the Earth. And we also have Chandrayaan-1 by India, which was launched on um, October 28th of 2008, and it made India to be the first nation to impact the moon's south pole um, a month later around. So why do we focus on the south pole? It's because the scientists have found um, there, there's water in the south pole, and th those are inside the shadow craters, which are the blue dots right here, and you can see that they're located inside the craters, that's because the sunlight, they only eliminate the list of the crater, which is around here, and, but not the low-laying regions. So those, um, the, inside the craters, those are called to be the permanently shadow regions. The temperature there is so cold that it even traps the mo water molecule as ice. So, and the water, since they're essential to our human life, and they also provide as a rocket fuel and coolant for our equipment. So it's really important to um, establish a moon base there. And other than the reason for considering the water, we also have um, constant solar power over at the South Pole. And there are also other abundant resources like hydrogen, oxygen, and many other metals, including iron and silicon. So it would be convenient to do a mining there as well. So it's really a desirable place for nations to establish the moon base there. And we come to the recent attempts um, for the South Pole. So we have Luna 25, which is this year's. And this is actually what year's we attempt on the moon after almost half a decade, after almost half a century. And it was launched on August 10th, 2023. However, it lost communication nine days later and reported crash near the South Pole. 
why is it so difficult to land on the South Pole? And even the Russia, they also crash the uh, lander. That's because those landers, they mainly rely on the camera to um, guide their approaches onto the surface. And the South Pole, as I've mentioned, the permanently shadow region, those are not being uh, lit, and therefore you making the mission to be um, really hard. And for the South Pole, there's also significantly less um, flat region. If you remember the elevation map, we could see many craters around there. And it's also increasing the difficulty of landing at the South Pole. But if you remember, after um, the news of the Russia's Luna 25 crash, a few days later, there's such a scene happening in India. So that is the success of Chandrayaan-3, and it was launched on July 14th, which is before um, the Russia's, and it landed on August 23rd, which is like three days later, four days later, and it became the first spacecraft to soft land near the South Pole, which is quite an achievement. How the soft landing works for Chandrayaan-3? What makes it different from um, the Russia's one? So for the Chandrayaan-3, there are actually four phases for the soft landing. And the important one are called the wolf breaking one, which is the first phase. In the beginning, um, it's not facing towards the surface of the moon, but rather perpendicular to. So it's flying at a speed of 1.68 kilometer per second, which is like 10 times faster than anything. And during this phase, it's um, slowing down to 358 meters per second. And it's also adjusting the, um, the direction towards the moon. And in the second, um, in the third phase, which is called to be the fine breaking phase, it's finally adjusted um, the direction of this lander towards the surface of the moon. These two are the most important phases, and this 15 minutes is really like um, riding a roller coaster. <laughs> yeah. And they have also applied um, several cutting edge technologies. One is, one is the solar panels. They have include, um, installed all the solar panels um, on all sides. And that ensures the power supply works, even the lander lands in an unfavorable um, direction. And there's also one thing called laser Doppler velocimeter, which is to monitor the lander speed and make small adjustments to the directions. And they're also having the algorithms for hazard detection and avoidance so all of these cutting edge technologies, they're really the wisdom, really shows the wisdom and also the endeavors to challenge. And then in the future, um, the US, we're gonna have a Artemis program. So it's led by the NASA with um, Europe, Germany, Japan, Japan, Canada, Israel, and Italy. And the purpose of the Artemis program is to establish um, human's presence on the moon since Apollo 17 in 1972, which is also like um, half a century. And this is the logo of Artemis program, which is similar to the Apollo one, because um, in Greek script, Artemis is actually um, the sister of Apollo. And this is the picture of Artemis one, which has been rendered um, last year, 2022. And the second purpose of the Artemis program is to build the Lunar Gateway, which made it to be the first extraterrestrial space station outside of the Earth. And it will serve as a space lab for, study, for studies of solar and cosmic rays. And since it is free of the Earth's gravity and magnetic field, so it made the Lunar Gateway to be a ideal space lab for conducting different experiments. And it would also serve as a living space for astronauts, and therefore it provides them 
um, a place to stay when they're doing mission on the moon or even to the outer space or to the Mars. So it is serves as an intermediate station. And for the Artemis programs, here are the early missions, which is the missions by 2030. And we have already landed Artemis 1, which is an uncrewed lunar orbit and return. And in the coming few years, 2024 and 2025, we are having Artemis 2 II and 3, which we are going to send humans back to the space and back to the moon. So we are going to do the lunar flyby and also um, try to land two people on at the South Pole. And after that, we will be mainly focusing on the lunar gateway that we have talked about, building on it. And for the other countries, um, for the Chang'e missions by China, they're going to do scientific missions, including collecting the lunar samples and also try to explore different resources around the South Pole. And they're planning to do the crew landing by 2030 as well. So, and then for the Russia, the lunar program, they're going to do the same, which includes the lunar lander um, orbiter and also trying to do the return. And they also plan to have a manned lunar orbit flight as well. And as for the India one, um, they are planning to have a collaboration with JAXA, which is the Japanese National Space Agency, to explore the South Pole as well. And it will be planned in around 2026. So other than the National Space Agencies, we also have private companies joining the journey as well. So for SpaceX, they have the DM Moon project, which is funded by which is actually funded by a Japanese billionaire, Yusaku. And he's traveling with um, eight artists and two technicians. And those eight artists, they are actually traveling for free. So if you really got, want to go to the space or to the moon, you have better know a rich people. <laughs> and they're taking the Starship made by SpaceX. And the Starship would be the first step, um, the moon, would be the first step for the Starship, and later the Starship would be the um, spacecraft to the Mars as well. And they are scheduled in the recent years, 2023 to 2024 as well. So in summary, um, so far we have, well, this photo is actually as of July 2019. So far we have already got around 50 landings on the moon, and this is um, pretty exciting. And from the moon missions, we have also learned the origin of the moon, and also we have also learned the technologies to send people back and forth, to return to the Earth. So it's really um, quite a mission. Yeah, and lastly, we have the Buzz Lightyear motto to infinity and beyond. So thanks for listening. That will be the end of our talk. And the next talk will be November 4th on the gravitational wave background discoveries. Yeah. Um, currently, there's no cooperation between NASA and China, you know, they're in competition, kind of. And India, there's also no cooperation, but India has actually signed a contract, uh, which is called Artemis Accords, like, as, which is like the rules on the moon, yeah. This, this.
this one. Yep. So the green is soft on this one. So what are the other two colors that you use? Like the yellow and red, for example. Oh, the yellow, the yellow one there. Um, the the green one is soft landing, and well, this one is actually quite a low resolution, so I couldn't see those as well. <laughs> Sorry for that. I think they both say some form of crash. Both of them are one by two. I think the red one might be a crash. <laughs> yeah, total failure. someone in an orbit would not be a big step compared to what landing someone would be. So Lyndon Johnson decided that maybe we should try doing something that's, that will take a significant amount of technological development so that we get some time to develop it before maybe the Soviets can take up on it. And in fact, what happened is the Soviets did not take up on sending a probe. They, they focused more on bringing samples back or taking pictures. Of it. So I think that's probably the reason. Thank you for listening. Oh.